a warm alo aloha and hello to each of you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for Ask Me, our educational webinar series. My name is Audra Hines, Vice President of Care Services for the ALS Network. I want to thank all of our industry partner sponsors for the Ask Me series, as well as a huge special thanks to Cheryl Barber and Judy Stewart for their tremendous support of the California ALS Research Summit, along with our other mission benefactor families. It goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, your contributions are amazing and we could not make programs like this one tonight possible without these generous donations to the ALS Network. You'll see a new look tonight to our name, our logo, and our overall brand. ALS Golden West is now the ALS Network. Our mission is to partner with the ALS community as we drive the discovery of prevention strategies, treatments, and cures for ALS, provide access to quality care and connection, and promote initiatives to improve health outcomes. Our quality services remain. More than 15 care managers work tirelessly every day so our clients and loved ones have access to loans of equipment, referrals to some of the top ALS clinics and specialists in the country, navigation of benefits and emotional support through a variety of ways. It's this direct work that fuels our efforts in best serving our communities. Our advocacy efforts are increasing. We work on both state and federal levels as we grow our number of activists who wanna help change the landscape of access to new therapies and better specialty care to impact real progress. And our research initiatives are expanding. We partner with clinicians, researchers, and industry partners who specialize in ALS so we can support the advancement of critical ALS research. It's a different name and a fresh look, but it's the same high quality, impactful services, programs, and events we've always held ourselves to for our communities. We remain steadfast in our commitment to all of you, and you'll see more from us in the near future about ALS care, advocacy, and research plans for the future. To learn more about ALS Network and all of the services we provide, please visit alsnetwork.org for more information. We're excited to bring you this important annual educational program for the ALS community as a follow-up to the 14th annual California ALS Research Summit. The ALS Network is proud to serve as the founding sponsor of the Research Summit since its inception, and we're so grateful to collaborate with some of the country's leading ALS scientists and clinicians like the ones we have here tonight. Presenting the latest and greatest updates in the field of ALS research will be the chair of the California ALS Research Network, Dr. Clive Svensson, who is the executive director of the Cedar sinai Regenerative Medicine Institute. And we're also joined by Dr. Jill Goslinga, assistant professor of neurology at the UCSF Neuromuscular and ALS Division, and part of the Western ALS Consortium executive team. They're gonna update us on the outcomes of this year's ALS Research Summit, including a spe special presentation on the Barber ALS Research Awards. I'm gonna say hello first to Dr. Svensson. I'd love to begin with you. Thank you so, so much for being here as always. And I'm gonna turn things over to you. We're excited for your insights from the summit. Well, thanks so much, Olga. Great to be back uh, this year and uh, filling you in on the exciting summit. Um, so why don't we start with the first slide <clears throat> and then I'll sort of take you through things. So yeah, this is the, and, and, and I love the blue color and uh, the new look and uh, the ALS network with more of the same fantastic services. And we're gonna be doing with the network, uh, fantastic science. Uh, we, Jim Barber really named it the network uh, because his dream and passion was for us to work together uh, in, a, in a system of collaboration. And it's really, it really has been a, <clears throat> uh, a joy to be part of this for the last 14 years and uh, very proud to, to be chairing this network. And it really has now, this name has kind of uh, brought Jim's uh, dream, I think, to fruition. And as Audra said, the main key is collaboration. It's not just researchers sitting in a room, it's researchers with clinicians, with industry. <clears throat> and we believe by bringing all those three together, we have a lot bigger chance of making things happen in ALS. And importantly, the reason we're talking to you all is get the patients involved and get the patients seeing what we're doing in a transparent way and trying to help them understand how the research is moving forward. We're not gonna find a cure for ALS without understanding the basic causes of the disease. So this is a network and these beautiful people here are part of it. Have the next slide. 
the summit was again formed 14 years ago. This is a picture we it only took us about half an hour to get everybody in the right place. This was the most complex part of the meeting was taking the picture. Uh, we managed it. And uh, right there, you can see a group of people who are part of the original network, Don Cleveland on the far right and John Rabbits. Um, and of course, Fred Fisher there, you all you know, and Audra, uh, Sherry, myself, uh, Justin, Richard Smith, uh, and many, many others here. And in fact, just behind Richard on the left there, is Michael Hayden, who uh, we'll talk about in a second. He's got some fantastic new prospects for drugs for ALS. But all of these people are dedicated to ALS. Uh, and this meeting <clears throat> is kind of unique in that it's the only one really, I think, that gets the clinicians, researchers, and industry so tightly packed together. Uh, we worked really hard for two days to try and understand more about this disease. And it was a very exciting meeting on the next slide. Let me take you through some of the highlights, guys. Um, First, it was uh, just a few days ago, the next slide. And <clears throat> the uh, meeting drew about 200 people in this year. We, we don't advertise this meeting. It's really word of mouth. People want to come back every year. Uh, we have a lot of continuation. So it's not like we get a whole new set of people in every year. Uh, this is a network and a collaboration so that each year we build on programs that we started the year before. And that's what's really satisfying to see how things have matured over the last 14 years. And this 200 number is about right for an informative meeting. And we hear that people love this number more and you start getting too big and less and it's not an energy. <clears throat> we have 40 speakers. Um, and uh, we did have people now coming from throughout the US to talk. Have the next slide. <clears throat> so what are the outcomes uh, from this summit? So I'll spend a few minutes just very high level taking you through. Uh, what we talked about. Now, many of you have probably heard of gene therapy uh, for ALS, and that's when we're trying to put new genes into the brain to uh, modulate the motor neuron death. And the problem is getting these genes into the brain is very difficult. We have to use viruses, adenoviruses uh, are, are very popular, and the virus then infects the brain and then delivers the gene that might be uh, providing some support to those motor neurons that are under stress and dying into the brain's spinal cord. So Viviana Gradinuru uh, from Caltech gave the first opening talk on how do we get these um, genes into the brain. She's a fantastic scientist and came up with some brilliant ideas on new ways to get drugs into the brain. And then, of course, <clears throat> this is the most exciting, one of the most exciting parts in the meeting. Uh, ASOs, you've probably all heard of, antisense oligonucleotides. Boy, have they been exciting. Um, this all kind of started with Richard Smith uh, and on uh, Cleveland here in a meeting we had 14 years ago. It was at the very beginning. And in fact, this uh, network has been one of the reasons that ASOs have gotten as far as they have. And again, industry, Biogen, and uh, particularly Ionis, which is our own Californian company that makes these ASOs. What are ASOs? Antisense oligonucleotides. Essentially, they can modulate any gene in the cell to, to affect the protein in the cell. And that means that you it's like a drug that can target specific parts of the cell biology and allow you to manipulate particular areas of the cell biology. Now, of course, a lot of you heard of SOD1, and if you have a mutation in that gene, you get ALS. Remember, about 12 to 13% of all ALS is genetic. We know exactly the mutation that's causing it, whereas the other 85% we call sporadic. <clears throat> um, it could still be genetic, we just don't know the cause. That's what we're trying to understand. We'll get to that later. ASOs are very good to target forms of ALS where we know the cause. Two types, SOD1, um, is we know the gene, and what Ionis did and Biogen is they actually developed an ASO that knocked down the mutant SOD1, the bad SOD1 in patients. They gave it to a bunch of patients. Uh, they made their, uh, their clinical trial endpoints, and in fact, that was provisionally approved by the uh, FDA very recently. <clears throat> so we now have, for the first time, a treatment for SOD1 ALS. That is super exciting, guys. Uh, we had Biogen present their data. They're in the middle of a, a bigger trial to really understand how strong this effect is. But certainly some patients were stabilizing, which never happens, uh, or even getting a little better, which is quite phenomenal. And this is an uh, antisense oligo, ASO, you're gonna hear more and more about them. First discovered by scientists in California and the company collaboration and, and Richard Smith in particular and Don Cleveland uh, got an award for that technology a few years ago from uh, the network. So we're very proud of this. The second, uh, we had a speaker in actually from the East Coast, uh, 
Another type of mutation, very rare, uh, is a FUS mutation, <clears throat> FUS, and that's very rare. And it does cause ALS, and it's an early onset form of ALS, quite often in children. It's very sad, uh, very rapid progressing. And here they, they have an ASO now for knocking down that bad FUS protein. They gave it to a, a number of patients, and, and Neil Schneider showed some amazing data, very exciting, and particularly one girl who... Uh, got treated, and in six months, nothing was happening, and suddenly she started getting better. And in fact, uh, she was initially in a wheelchair. <clears throat> At the end of the trial, she's now walking upstairs. They showed a video. Two, two different genetic forms of ALS, where I think for the first time, we're starting to see improvements in patients, not just stop, slowing it down or stopping it, because we're stopping the toxic event that we know causes it. The key now, and all the discussion we're having in the meeting is, can we find causes of other types of ALS that don't have a specific mutation. If we can find the cause, we might be able to deliver ASOs or drugs to, to pr protect the motor neurons and stop them from dying. So this is where all of the important work is going on at the network, trying to understand more about, about this disease. So the SO session was very interesting. Uh, we then have all updates from uh, all the clinical trials that are going on. <clears throat> There's a number of very exciting trials uh, from a range of different companies. Uh, some of these companies, were, well, most of the companies were at the event. I'm very happy to say they sponsor the event and help us fund uh, this amazing uh, meeting. Um, so we went through some of those companies like Denali uh, and uh, speakers uh, ranged from uh, Angela Genj uh, and uh, people from uh, companies like Prolina and Amalex that you've heard of um, and Amadis. We're actually, Amadis were very interesting. They, they're finding that you can see, detect changes in proteins like TDP43, which are involved in ALS, actually in the back of the eye, sometime before you see changes in the brain, perhaps. So they're using that now to look in the eye to see if the eye might give you a clue as to whether you have ALS or not and how it's progressing. So very exciting and different, different types of approaches. We then had a clinical trial update and clinical updates. There we had a very active discussion about affordability of treatment <laughs> and the cost of treatment versus the effect. So if you only have another three to four months survival with a drug, is it fair to charge hundreds of thousands of dollars? Uh, very active discussion and a very complex area uh, for us all to think about. Then we uh, went to CERM, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, the state who's funding um, a lot of stem cell research. Uh, we heard from a number of speakers about different approaches using stem cells. And uh, we actually updated on our trial at Cedar sinai And in that trial, we're providing a, a rather unique way of doing a brain transplant. We're transplanting stem cells into the brain and the parts of the brain that degenerate in ALS. And these stem cells are engineered to make GDNF, and that's a growth factor, which slows cells from dying. So we presented some data on the first four patients. Uh, and by the way, that trial is now open. If anybody's interested, uh, please contact me um, and we can uh, let you know about details of the trials and open trial in the state of California. And the uh, network will let you know about other trials that are open as well. So please contact the network to understand what trials are available uh, for you. And the next slide. So now we're on to um, the part of the second part of the talk. Now, TDP43, of course, is very exciting in ALS. It's the protein that in every patient, this protein is kind of leaks out of the nucleus of the cell, uh, out of the, the heart of the cell and gets into this uh, the outside region. And that then uh, we know causes some issues and some of the motor neuron death may be related to that. So we had a nice discussion about that. Um, lots of different biology, very complex biology, to be honest. Um, but understanding this biology of TDP43 might give us clues in sporadic ALS of what causes it. And you'll hear a little bit more about TDP43 uh, in the uh, talks you're gonna hear in a second from the amazing Barbara Wardman. There's also folding this protein and, and proteins so you've got to think, some people think of ALS and other degenerative diseases as a problem with the garbage cans in, in the brain cells. But if you like your garbage can, if it never got filled, uh, uh, tipped out and, and uh, emptied every week, what would happen? The garbage can would overflow, your house would be full of garbage, and uh, you'd suffocate inside the house. A little bit like that, we think in ALS, is the, the garbage cans are being emptied efficiently. They're spilling out, they're causing problems inside the motor neuron, the motor neuron gets paralyzed and you get paralyzed. So by understanding protein and how proteins are degraded and proteins are the garbage of the cell, you make it, you need it for a few months sometimes and then you've got to get rid of it. If the garbage can doesn't work, protein builds up 
And after 60, 70, 80 years, remember, we only have one set of neurons. They, they, the neuron you're born with has to last your whole life. And so it's very valuable. Those motor neurons are incredibly valuable. And if they get garbage build up, then it's a problem. So we're trying to understand why that garbage is building up. And had a lot of discussion about that in, in that session. Uh, we then finalized, uh, finally got to the end. We were very tired, but we kept going. And these meetings are quite intense. My brain was aching towards the end, but uh, I love this uh, research so much in terms of how it can affect potentially ALS that, that all of us kept going. Um, and the last session was really looking about how um, artificial intelligence is involving, it's involving all parts of, the, of our lives. It's also involving ALS in that we're now trying to grow um, patient motor neurons. So we can now do a brain biopsy. It's we take cells from a patient, we reprogram them to be pluripotent. And these are the pluripotent stem cells. And now we can turn them into motor neurons that die in, in your brain and your spinal cord. And that technology is allowing us now to look at these motor neurons and ask questions about their type, size, uh, are they normal or abnormal? And AI technology, artificial intelligence, can now screen those motor neurons for differential states using a wide range of analyses on these motor neurons. So it's like a machine that's kind of learning, <clears throat> looks at the ALS motor neurons, and it looks at the control, and it says, what's different? And then it backs into like, well, if that's different, is there a drug that can repair it? And some of the great work that Justin Achita and his group is doing, and uh, they're now finding ways to use your own stem cells to understand whether a drug might work for you. And I just got off a call with Merit Tchaikovich at, at uh, Mass General before this meeting, um, and she's got work uh, going on over there as well. And, and the, the platform trial, which we discussed, which is where you can actually have uh, four or five drugs in the same trial and use one placebo group. And we'd love to get more of this precision health where you you know, bring patients in based on their brain biopsy, which is, an, which is a, this, these iPS cells making the motor neurons, use AI, decide which drug, and then you go into a trial knowing that your cells will respond to the drug. Very, very exciting, very uh, tricky work, but very, very exciting. And this new technology of iPS cells is, is really interesting. And there are two companies there, uh, Modulo Bio and Incitro, who are pioneering this area as well. And I think what was nice was us all sitting together to understand how these new technologies and how companies can work with the clinicians to get the patients and can work with the researchers and work with bioinformaticists who understand AI to bring home this technology. And it was great to have folks from Stanford, UCSD, and all the experts on AI uh, at the same table as um, the researchers and the scientists and the industry folks. So very exciting. Right, so that's a very high level summary. I'm, I'll take some questions at the end, but let's move on to the most exciting part of the uh, meeting, which is the young folks who come and present posters. And uh, here we're really, uh, this is uh, really our founder, Jim Barber, um, and his beautiful wife and family were there. And, and Jim passed away of ALS, but he, his memory is, is with us all. And uh, very, he's very, very inspiring. Uh, and as you can see there, uh, David and Sandy were at the meeting um, and we're very excited. Well, Sandy was there for sure. Um, and Cheryl and Sandy and Cheryl then, uh, were there to see the uh, patient win of uh, the uh, poster winners. Uh, each poster winner gets a thousand dollars prize and uh, stimulating. It gets the uh, students going. And uh, as Jim would say, never give up and always give back. And we all really are uh, very excited to have the Barber Award this year. And uh, thinking of Jim uh, as, I, as I do very often and how he inspired all of us and, and all the work we do in ALS. So thank you, Jim and Cheryl. All right, so now let's move on to the winners. And uh, this is a previous set of, of winners. And what we do is we, we invite back the winners from last year to judge the new winners. So uh, every year we get a new set. So I've, let's get to the uh, roll call. Uh, so we have a drum roll. These uh, are the award winners from before. And let's get to this year. We'd like to thank all the previous winners. So this year we have... Um, three winners who are going to give you uh, short presentations of uh, their research. So I'm very excited to have them here. And then I grill them afterwards with, with nice questions. And so we'll bring them up maybe in that order. Is that good, Frederick, uh, Kawai, and Kevin? It's good with me. Yeah. Should, should I start sharing my screen? Yeah, I think we're ready for it. Go ahead. All right. 
Let's see. By the way, there's a very hard competition this year. There was 25, 22 posters and we were tough. It was a long discussion, but we finally, after enough beers and discussion, we got to a result. So congratulations to both to all of you for winning this year. Well, thanks. And it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I'm really glad I'm able to share a little bit of my work with everyone here. Um, and Clive, actually his background fits perfectly in with um, my introduction. Um, but I'll reinforce some important points. And so what, what is motivating um, my research is this challenge of finding targets to treat sporadic ALS. And so like Clive said, ALS is only caused by um, a known inherited mutation in a little over 10% of cases. And fortunately, there are developing gene therapy approaches to treat um, some of these, um, these genetic cases, and some are looking quite promising. Um, However, the remaining 90% of ALS cases are due to an unknown combination of genetic or environmental risk factors. Um, but almost all ALS patients, regardless of the upstream cause, exhibit this, this mislocalization of, of the protein TDP43, which suggests that there might be a shared disease mechanism to target. And I think that also there was a question in the chat from a, a Paul, from Paul, and and that so that is the answer that yeah, um, nearly all ALS patients, regardless of the cause, have this mislocalization of TDP forty three, and in patient cells, what this looks like is sort of loss of TDP forty three from this nuclear compartment where it's normally performing its its function in the cell to the cytoplasm, and eventually in these pathological aggregates you see um, at the end stage. And what TDP43 does is it functions at the step of regulating um, a number of processing steps in, at the RNA level. So if you if you remember to whatever your last biology class was, um, our genetic information is encoded in our DNA, which is transcribed into RNA, which basically serves as a message to, to bring this information to another part of the cell to be turned into protein, which ultimately carries out most cellular functions. Um, however, what's really happening at that RNA level is much more complicated than that schematic I showed on the last slide. And TDP43 is functioning at a lot of these steps of, of RNA processing. And so in the last few years, um, a lot of really great work has been done to understand TDP43 function in RNA processing. And you'll probably be hearing more soon about some of the targets that have been identified, these Staphman 2 and UNC13A, sort of these new important RNAs that TDP43 regulates. Um, and so my work is basically investigating another aspect of RNA processing that is known to be regulated by TDP43, but hadn't yet been studied in the context of ALS. And that's called alternative polyadenylation, which just refers to the fact that at this tail end, three prime tail end of an RNA transcript, um, the transcript can be terminated at different locations, which can result in a shorter tail or a longer tail. And within this part of the RNA transcript, a lot of regulation can happen that can have important consequences um, further downstream, like at the protein level. Um, and so we think this is a really important part of TDP43 function. And our hope is that we might find um, also new targets that are relevant to all ALS because they all share this common pathology of, of TDP43 mislocalization. And so all I'll say about my poster is basically we found that hundreds of these alternative polyadenylation events are changing in the context of ALS, which is really exciting. And we are hoping, uh, and, and we learned some, some common themes about how TDP43 regulates this process. And we hope to add some new um, therapy targets to this growing list of, of potential targets for sporadic ALS. And that is it. So thanks for yeah your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, any questions? You please put into the Q and A. I have one on C nine. I'll do that in a little bit. Um, but Eric, maybe do you think there's in terms of TDP forty three? What do you think it's um, causing the disease or do you think it's maybe something secondary to something else triggering it being released where do you think als starts have you got any clues on that because it's always a question that comes up it is a great question i i don't think that tdp43 is is uh at the 
far upstream end. I do think there's something else that is inducing TDP43 mislocalization. Um, I think probably a combination of some genetic variants that together cause problems combined with aging. Um, I personally think that there could be some immune, innate immune system component to disease because a lot of the proteins implicated in ALS function in the innate immune system, including TDP43, which was first identified because it binds to HIV virus, actually. Um, but I think that, that the things that happen once TDP43 is stuck in the cytoplasm um, could be really important for causing neuronal loss. So I do think there are ter therapy targets to mine there, even though it's not um, the most upstream cause. Unless you have a mutation of TDP43, which is a really great clue that it how, about how important it is. Yes, and mutations, as we know, are very, very severe. If you have a mutation, it's, it causes a lot of problems. In fact, they try to knock it out right in mice, and it, it's an essential protein to the cell. So if you get rid of it, you've just got to kind of have enough to, to get a phenotype. So it's a, it's a hard one. Last question, and, and if anybody else has a question, please uh, please ask. Um, but there's, there's a form of ALS that I mentioned called SOD1. It's a mutation SOD1 gene, gain of function. Yeah, you don't see any TDP mislocalization or pathology. Why is, what do you think is going on? And does, what does this tell us about ALS, do you think? Eric? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that is the one exception. Well, I guess FUS maybe also, FUS ALS. Um, you know, it's like a, a, bit, a topic for a, a different day, whether it could even be a different disease. I don't know if, you, just to ask you a question quickly for a follow-up, do you truly believe that they are the exact same disease or, 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 you know, because SOD1 often is a very pure motor phenotype. Sometimes the other forms of sporadic ALS can exist on the spectrum with FTD. Other brain regions may be more likely to be involved. So I almost, it's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but I almost wonder if there is a distinction there. Um, however, SOD1 mutations also lead to motor neuron death, but it does seem to be a bit more pure and now there's even emerging evidence of tdp43 pathology being maybe important in alzheimer's disease uh, certainly important in ftd um but i do think it helps us understand sort of maybe um different mechanisms that ultimately when they go wrong lead to motor neuron death um yeah eric i think you summarize what i was you know the way i think it's a similar way and I think Justin Achita once gave a great talk where he had motor neuron death at the bottom of the ski resort, you know, where you put your skis on and the bottom of the lifts. And then he had the mountain and then he had all the different top parts of the mountain that you could ski down. So all the way you start from very different SOD1, you know, C9, all these different areas. But the end point is motor neuron death. But that could be happening from a hundred different ways. And that's why it's so complicated to understand ALS is many different ways to kill a motor neuron. I was going to say, actually, like the more we study motor neurons, I think it becomes harder to believe that they ever function normally in in a lot of people because they're so they have to maintain, you know, their their health and function over these huge long distances in the body. Um, it's really a miracle that they function as well as they do. And so then it's easy to believe there's a lot of things that can disrupt this process. Um, yeah. Great. All right. Well, look, fantastic talk, Eric. Congratulations. We're going to go to the next uh, presenter now in this in the uh, Barber Awards. That's Kaiwei. And so if you can get your slides up, Kaiwei. And she's from Stanford. That's a little town north of here. Does, I think they've got a university. Uh, Stanford being the place to go. So please take it away, Kaiwei. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Taiwei from Dr. Aaron Gittler's lab at Stanford University. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Barber family and AOS Network uh, for this honor and also opportunity to share my work with you today. Uh, here's an overview of my poster, uh, and I will skip most of the details and uh, give you some of the highlights. Uh, thanks to Eric. Uh, I, don't th I think I don't have to uh, emphasize more how important the protein called TDP43 uh, is in AOS. Um, so as uh, Eric mentioned, uh, under disease condition, uh, this protein normally localizing the nucleus is mislocalized under disease condition. Uh, and besides the function uh, Eric was telling us about, 
Another important role of TP43 on gene expression uh, is by regulating RNA splicing process. So normal RNA splicing uh, removes non-coding regions from the mature RNAs to make functional, uh, accurate functional RNAs and proteins. However, uh, when TDP43 is mislocalized from the nucleus, uh, you will see these uh, cryptic snippets of uh, uh, sequences uh, uh, spliced in uh, in the final uh, mature RNAs. So my study aims to identify uh, genes affected by this abnormal RNA splicing process, uh, so-called cryptic RNA splicing, um, uh, due to the loss of TB43's function, uh, which can provide new insights uh, into potential therapeutic uh, targets broadly applicable to most people living with ALS. So by analyzing RNA sequencing data from patient samples, uh, we identify 65 genes that show cryptic RNA splicing uh, in neurons lacking nuclear TB43. And further investigation using neurons in a dish uh, enables us to pinpoint 12 genes as TB43's cryptic splicing targets, uh, including on 13 a uh, a gene associated with uh, ALS risk. Furthermore, uh, we were able to visualize these cryptic splicing events in patient samples at a single cell resolution, as indicated by these red punk tests, uh, which were only detected in neurons with TDP43 pathology. Interestingly, many of these genes are critical for neuronal function, specifically involved in a process called uh, neurotransmission, uh, by which neuron cells uh, can fire and transmit signals throughout the nervous system. So we found that PDP43 loss causes disruption of gene expression in these cryptic splicing targets. And by using electrodes to record neuronal activity in a dish, we showed that reducing PDP43 over its cryptic splicing targets impairs cryptic RNA splicing, uh, impairs uh, cryptic RNA splicing and neurotransmission. So highlighting the severe functional consequences. Uh, in summary, we propose that under disease condition, uh, nuclear TB43 depletion leads to cryptic RNA splicing uh, in genes that are critical for neuronal function, uh, causing defective protein production and impaired neurotransmission. Uh, currently, we're working on developing new therapeutic strategies to target these uh, cryptic splicing events. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Chloe. Fantastic work. Um, I just heard from um, from Jenica that you're actually working in an experiment in the lab, so you have to keep going off camera. So you're, you're feeding some cells behind you or doing some preps. Um, so uh, thanks for taking the time to to talk to us. So it's a bit like so sure. these cryptic exons are fascinating, right? It's like in this case, you've got to keep the policeman there, the TDP, to keep an eye on it. And as soon as they leave, they kind of get naughty and start start expressing in the wrong kind of protein. Um, why, why do you think they're there? I mean, why would, why, would a, why would the cell even have cryptic exons? Isn't it a bit dangerous to have those there? And, and what do you think they've evolved for a reason or why are they there? Yes, uh, uh, I have to say that RNA splicing is actually a very important and essential uh, uh, process uh, to all of our cells in our body. Uh, that's how uh, the, whole, the cells from the whole body uh, have have the same genome have, have have the same genetic information, but each cell can uh, produce different functional proteins that make it as as uh, hair cells or heart cells uh, or skin cells or motor neurons. Um, so that's how this RNA splicing process contribute to the complexity uh, of our uh, protein products in uh, in, in 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 the cells. Um, however. Uh, so that's why this process need to be tightly regulated. Uh, however, in disease, uh, once this process is, misregu is misregulated um, because of uh, this disease protein, TB43 is lost uh, in the nucleus. Um, so that's why uh, we have all those um, random like cryptic things happening in, in, our, uh, in, our, in our RNAs and uh, leading to uh, function, uh, functional uh, uh, consequences in our protein production and neuronal function. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I'm, I'm still curious as to why they're even there. Why didn't they, you know, why aren't they perfect? Why? It's just a strange thing to have. It's a dangerous thing, right, to have. So maybe they're there for evolutionary purposes or trying to make make things of it. It's, it's interesting. What people often forget with humans is we are an animal species and we're evolving all the time and, and we don't understand, you know, the biology, but every time we have an offspring, it's very different. Each offspring has to be different. And in fact, the genome has to engineer in mistakes and the genome yes. is made to make mistakes because evolution works off mistakes, right? So I think it's kind of interesting that sometimes these cryptic exons or, or genetic mutations or differences are, are very powerful because it might be, in some cases, you, you need to have that weird protein made because the cell needs to adapt to say climate warming, warming, you know, the, the climate's getting warmer, so you've got to, so it's, um, when we do science and we're looking at human samples, we always want things to be the same. We want every patient to be the same and the ALS must be different to the control of the disease. I think what we always forget is that individual patients are actually evolved, have been genetically designed to have errors so that we create diversity and so the environment can work on it. And I think some of the, these things are in there as an evolutionary challenge for us, right? So it's kind of exciting that we're working and, and scary, we're working against evolution in some ways. Okay, we've got some couple of questions. I think they're better for the whole group. So unless anybody else has got a question for Kaiwei, we'll move to the last one and then we'll open it up for more general. Great, great presentation, Kaiwei. Very exciting on cryptic exons. I like that. Cryptic is always a fa my favorite word. It's a very woody word. Yeah. We'll go to the Thank last you. talk uh, from UC San Diego, down in the south of the state. Thank north you. to south. All right, let me... Start sharing here. Okay, awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UC San Diego, um, and uh, I'm really honored to have won one of the poster awards. And I want to talk briefly about my research. And I'm coming at ALS from the uh, perspective of aging. Um, so aging is one of the most prominent risk factors for ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. As you get older, you're more likely to develop a neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so uh, why is this the case? Why, uh, what causes uh, your neurons to destabilize as you get older um, and to have these issues that might um, predispose you for ALS? This is especially important because for 90% of ALS cases, we have no known familial cause um, that's leading to ALS. So there's something else that might be contributing here. And we think, I think that aging is a really uh, important component that's hard to study. Um, so to kind of get at this, uh, question of aging, we uh, leveraged an approach to essentially make old neurons in a dish. And so uh, what I want to talk about briefly is that our usual approach is the bottom here in which we are going from uh, generously donated patient samples, we're reprogramming these into stem cells, and then we will differentiate these into neurons within a dish. Um, this process works really well and it's led to a lot of important insights. Uh, the problem is that these neurons, they look like they're uh, very young, they're embryonic in terms of their um, uh, status and all of their uh, problems. They've kind of reset and removed all these damaged uh, proteins and RNAs that have accumulated over your lifetime. So what we did is we instead take patient fibroblasts and we directly differentiate them into neurons. This process is a little bit trickier and a little bit more different, um, but it allows us to make neurons that look old in uh, all the different ways that we looked at them. And so now that we have these old neurons, we can start to figure out what's wrong with them, um, what is happening in aging that might predispose people to uh, develop ALS, and can we push the neurons back into more of a healthier or younger state that allows us to kind of treat ALS or prevent ALS in general. Um, so I just wanna briefly summarize some of the uh, results that I've looked or that I've noticed when I've been uh, looking at these old neurons. Um, right now we're working on characterizing them, and then once we have uh, characterize them, we want to then leverage these neurons to uh, identify potential treatments that are relevant in this like, you know, uh, concept of aging. So we've noticed in these older neurons, and these are older neurons from normal people that haven't developed ALS, we've noticed that TDP is already mislocalized within older neurons. So this means that TD43, this protein that we've talked about a lot, um, it's already moving from the nucleus to the cytoplasm where it's not supposed to be. And this is just in normal older people. Um, We've also noticed that there's changes in splicing because of this TDP movement. So there's all sorts of um, changes of splicing at cytoskeletal proteins that are important for neuronal function and for making sure that our neurons are healthy and working. 
Um, we've also noticed that the stress response, and this is like a molecular stress response, um, is kind of hyperactive within these older neurons. These older neurons are, they're just stressed out. They're not very happy. And so all of these together kind of point to um, a bunch of molecular insults that are happening um, with, at, with these neurons. And we think that the, this cumulatively drives uh, neuronal health downward. So, you know, you might have some risk factors um, due to your genetics. You might have some risk factors due to um, uh, other things that you're born with. But then there's also this aging component that um, decreases neuronal health as a function of aging. And then potentially alongside other factors, this might lead um, to uh, the degeneration that we, uh, that we see in ALS. And so now what we're trying to work on is working with these old neurons and seeing if we can push them back up this uh, chart here so they don't look as old in that um, we're kind of preventing uh, this neurodegeneration from happening. So far we've uh, identified this inhibitor that might help uh, reduce the stress phenotype that we're seeing, but I'm working uh, really hard to try and find more and more uh, potential treatments that could help uh, with ALS in the context of aging. And so that kind of wraps up my talk. This is the poster that uh, presented, but uh, yeah. All right, let me stop sharing. Okay. I now have my official ALS network uh, here on. Uh, we have a nice badge here for the new network <laughs> and the big we had at the party that we uh, had to celebrate the founding of the ALS network. And so very, Happy to be now just to finish up, Kevin, um, and ask you a question, and then we'll open it up. You can all put your cameras back on from the group. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> the idea of aging is very important because one thing we know is causing ALS is, is aging because people, many, you know, you have the mutation for ALS, for instance, SOD1 or C9, and you, but you don't get the disease until sometimes you're 50 or 60 or 70 years old, which means you must have had your whole life with that mutation inside your body. So I think this intersection with aging is very important. And if we can apply that um, in these really interesting models that you're developing, it's going to be very powerful. Um, one of the things is, you know, the amount of fibroblasts, you know, the adult cells that you can get. The nice thing with stem cells is you can get as many as you want. Do you think there's any way you could age a stem cell to look like a fibroblast so you don't have to get the fibroblasts from the patients. Fibroblasts come from the skin, guys. You have to have a little skin biopsy, um, but we can only get so many. So what about aging maybe IPS cells? And... Yes, absolutely. So I, and that's one of the side aims of this project is to figure out what exactly makes these neurons old so that um, stem cells are adaptable, they're, they're easy to work with, and you can um, make them into any cell type you want very easily. Um, so they're a great model system. We've learned a lot from stem cells. I think one of the aims of what I'm wor working on right now is to figure out what exactly makes a neuron old. And if we can take what is making that neuron old and then put it into a stem cell derived neuron, can we make that stem cell derived neuron old and then do more complicated experiments to experiments across many different cell lines. Um, and so I'm, I'm starting to get into uh, what, what the proteomic changes are as, uh, as a function of age. So not just looking at like one cell line, looking at many cell lines of people um, as they get older and trying to understand, you know, what, what's changing and what's driving this older fate. And can we put it into a system that's easier to work with um, to make these more aging relevant studies? Oh, Clive, you're still muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, very exciting. Uh, my dog was barking downstairs. I think he's scared of my cat or something. Anyway, so I turned my <laughs> microphone off for a second. Um, very exciting approaches, guys, all three of you. Why not, is there any questions you want to ask each other quick? We finished. We've got a few minutes left. Anybody got a question for the other one? Sometimes it's uh, they come up. Not immediately for me. I'll think about it. <laughs> Okay, Eric, it's done. Okay, well, do you have a, any other questions for either Kevin or Eric? I have a quick question for Kevin. Uh, okay. I'm wondering, like, uh, these uh, old neurons you make, uh, can you make lo those for different, like, disease, neuro neurodegenerative disease, um, or um, is it, like, more specific, specific for AOS? So it will work for any uh, line or any uh, neurodegenerative disease that we have the uh, cells for. So um, in particular, most of the um, 
cell lines or most of the approaches or trans differentiation approaches is that we were using uh, rely on fibroblasts. So as long as we have a patient fibroblast from that particular neurodegenerative disease, we can do the trans differentiation. The question is whether you can make the right cell type or neuronal type for that disease. So for instance, if you want to study Huntington's disease, you need striatal neurons. If you want to study um, ALS, you want to make motor neurons. Uh, Alzheimer's, it's cortical neurons. So it's, you know, it's all these different types of neurons. Um, that, that process takes a little bit of more time to set up than it would for an IP or a stem cell derived neuron, but um, it is something that would be, it is compatible um, with basically any neurodegenerative disease. Thanks. Maybe I do have a quick question. Um, hey, last one. <laughs> for Kevin. Um, when you're in your effort to understand what makes the old neurons older, um, are you looking at specific cellular pathways or are you also thinking more along like the lines of epigenetics? Um, and, and if it isn't epigenetics, can you use what you learn to manipulate that in IPS cells? Yeah, so um, I, we kind of went in a little bit biased, but mostly unbiased. Um, what, one of the big things that came out when we were looking at these neurons is the old neurons are basically depleted of most RNA binding proteins. And so this umbrella includes a lot of ALS associated proteins like TDP um, and FUS and uh, all these other ALS proteins. Um, so we, we went in and we kind of saw these RNA binding proteins were uh, downregulated and we kind of went from there. What is causing that downregulation, what's causing all these issues appears to be an accumulation of misfolded proteins. Um, and those misfolded proteins are likely arising from even more problems with the mitochondrial. So it's kind of, or the mitochondria, which is what makes all the energy in the cell. So it's kind of like you're, we're trying to delineate this pathway and see how high up it goes. I definitely could see it ending at like the epigenetics of like, you know, oh, this protein had bad, ex uh, or this, this transcript was, you know, silenced or overexpressed or something and that caused everything to cascade down. Okay, guys, we have some more questions, but I'm going to hold those for um, after Jill's talk. And I'll just ask you to finish off, guys, maybe one or two sentences about why you got into ALS research. We'll start with you, Kai Kaiwei. You know, what was it that got you interested and what, you know, what inspires you a little bit in, in the research that you're doing? Yeah, uh, the reason why I'm interested uh, coming, join this field is I'm very interested in RNA biology and how RNA uh disruption like leads to disease, including like Alzheimer's disease and other diseases. And uh, among all those diseases, uh, I think AOS has the most exciting research going on uh, uh, about this RNA biology disruption. So that's why uh, I really want to uh, use my uh, background knowledge uh, to apply to this uh, uh, field and uh, trying to look for uh, potential therapies for the, these devastating diseases. Great, and we're so Thanks. excited to have you as part of our community, Kaiwei. Eric? Yeah, so I started in grad school working on a, a, a rare neuromuscular disease, spinal and bulbar muscular atrophy, and really um, just, you know, uh, became, you know, fell in love with that research topic and that specific research community. And I knew I wanted to continue that, you know, for the rest of my research career. And the thing that's particularly interesting and challenging about ALS is what we've all been talking about the whole time, this, this sporadic nature of disease, which makes um, treatments very challenging. Unfortunately, it makes the biology really um, like a, a puzzle Um which you know keeps keeps me really engaged as well. So it's kind of the the double edged sword of that has has, has me stuck um, you know in ALS research and really really happy to be to be part of ALS research community. Great, Eric. We don't want to lose you, and uh, you know, nice. And hopefully, the network has got you interested and keep will keep you interested. Kevin, take us home. <laughs> yeah, I've also been working on ALS since grad school. I focused on FUS mutations and how they uh, caused changes in like aggregation for, uh, potential. And so it felt natural to keep on working on ALS. Um, uh, my grandfather had Parkinson's, so I, I know what it feels like to kind of have uh, this kind of, you know, difficult diagnosis. And I want to try and help uh, patients have more options and uh, at, le at least be able to know more about the disease and then, you know, generate these uh, more uh, potential therapeutics uh, that are going to be helpful to real people. And yeah, it's, it's a really important problem.
Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, we all appreciate that. And I think, you know, the, so the problem with ALS, guys, is it's such a, it's such a horrific and sad disease. Uh, the incidence of ALS is very similar to Parkinson's um, in the, the numbers, you know, that you get. But unfortunately, because patients don't live so long, Parkinson's patients accumulate. So there's about a million Parkinson's patients. There's only about thirty to 40,000 ALS patients in the U.S., unfortunately, because, because it's a, a very, very severe disease. So we lose them from the community. Uh, but the incidence is very, very similar to Parkinson's. And, and so I think we need more attention to ALS. Now, for you guys, I'm so excited. This is my favorite part of, of the meeting. Thanks so much for, for the presentations. I love doing the posters. Um, and remember, Watson and Crick discovered DNA. So it's a pop quiz. How old do you think Watson was when they discovered DNA? Well, I'll tell you the answer. Uh, he was 28. So, you know, just put that in mind when you're doing your experiments. He wasn't afraid to think out of the box and come out with a double helix. Uh, and so, you know, young people, what we need in this field, you're the guys that are, are generating these new, we all pretend we give talks, it's our stuff, it's not, it's your stuff. We all know you, you guys are generating the ideas. And so we're very excited to have you here. I will now hand over to Audra to uh, take us to Jill. And then at the end, I'll swing around and there are a few questions that I can come back to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Svensson. Thank you a million to the three Barber Award winners and huge congratulations. Obviously the work that you're doing is so impactful and um, so happy to have you in this field. Um, I wanna reintroduce Dr. Jill Goslinga, Assistant Professor of Neurology at the UCSF Neuromuscular and ALS Division. She has a very interesting presentation for us tonight and I will turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yep, we can see it great. Excellent. So I'm Jill Goslinga. I'm a predominantly clinically focused ALS neurologist at UCSF, although next year I'm swapping that a little bit. I got a grant to do some more ALS research and epidemiology. And I was a biochemistry major in college, and I've always just loved enzymatic function, molecular bio biology, and I'm no longer working in the bench research setting. And so I just love getting to go to conferences like this one and just almost be a spectator sport for the neuroscience of ALS, because I know it takes probably thousands of hours for each of the posters and papers and presentations. And I get to go and just kind of, just kind of go to the buffet and learn everything. And so I wanted to make this talk a little bit of a translating between two worlds as well as I can focusing on the biochemical underlying mechanisms of ALS, but specifically thinking about clinical care. So the mechanisms as they relate to different medications. My goal is to briefly in just 10 slides or so, summarize some of the key disease mechanisms in ALS and focusing on the medications Riliazole, Adarivone, Relivrio, Tofersen, as well as focusing on some of the clinical research options, including the Healy platform, Regimen F and Regimen G. So this is a bit wordy, but there's a picture which is almost more complicating, but I'm gonna discuss some of the overlapping mechanisms of ALS. So one of the big problems that leads to motor neuron injury and eventual death and weakness is problems with protein balance. So inside our cells, proteins need to be in the right place and at the right time doing the right thing. And that is imbalance in ALS. There's also a lot of problems with RNA function. So as has been discussed by the Barber winners and Dr. Svensson, RNA helps cells make proteins is one of the canonical dogma of, of central biology. But in ALS, there is renegade RNA that can damage cells, lead to weakness of those cells. There's also broken infrastructure. And I, I love the comment on the beauty that motor neurons even work when they work because our cells have this internal highway system and it's incredibly complicated and sophisticated to be able to maintain the shape and maintain the function of motor neurons. And so in ALS, there can be traffic jams in this very long and kind of elongated infrastructure. There's often free radical damage and oxidative stress and cellular stress that leads to molecular stress responses, which can also be toxic in ALS. And often there's mitochondrial dysfunction that can lead to progressive nerve cell injury and then weakness of the muscles. 
So abnormal proteins, people have been discussing in this talk, protein aggregation, TDP mislocalization to the outer part of the cells, no longer in the nucleus. So there's the wrong type of protein in the wrong place. We know both in sporadic and familial ALS, there's proteins that abnormally clump together outside of the nucleus where they should be. And these abnormal protein clusters really impair the normal function of nerve cells. So the nerve cells die, and then that leads to muscle weakness for patients. There's also an abnormal breakdown of protein. So I, I'm giving a plug to one of my colleagues at UCSF who got me interested in neuromuscular as a, as a field. So he was really interested in lysosomes and how lysosomal regulation and um, breakdown of the, the climate discussed it really well, like all of the garbage that builds up in cells, how if that process goes awry, that can lead to damage to motor neuron cells. And this was also discussed at the at the conference to the lysosomal dysfunction and problems with the recycling centers inside cells. There's also renegade RNA. So in ALS, especially in cases linked to the C9 open reading frame 72 mutation, there's altered RNA function that plays a critical role in cell death and leads to abnormal RNA sequences, abnormal kind of non-canonical, hearing some children just got home, um, some non-canonical protein building instructions, toxic aggregates. There's also broken infrastructure. So the cytoskeleton, that's the brick and mortar structure of a cell. And that's the cellular infrastructure that maintains both the shape as well as the organization inside a motor neuron. And it's really amazing to remember that a motor neuron, a single cell, its cell body, the main kind of the heart of it all is either in the brain or in the spine. And then the axon, so the connecting freeway, if you will, goes all the way from, say from the brain, all the way to the spine. And then that second neuron is from the spine all the way down to a toe. And in ALS, there's dysfunction of the cytoskeletal infrastructure, there's broken infrastructure that disrupts the cellular transport. And these long and fragile axons have kind of have multiple hits can lead to damage and death of the axon and then damage of the cell. So here we're getting into some of the medications. So free radicals are, I think of free radicals as the abnormal toxic electrons in oxidation and other reduction processes. So when there's when your cells break down energy and you need oxygen to break down the energy. One of the byproducts is this oxidative stress, these free radicals. And normally there's a process where proteins, including the superoxide dismutase one protein can kind of sop up and clean up all of these toxic free radicals. But as was discussed earlier in some forms of ALS where there's mutations in SOD1, these, um, the process to clean up the free radicals is damaged as well as there's abnormal aggregation and stickiness of the SOD1 protein itself. And so in early 2023, Kyle Saudi or Tofersen was approved as the intrafecal, meaning injection into the spinal canal region in the lower back of this injection of this antisense oligonucleotide, which is incredibly exciting for the field of ALS and really a great sign of um, potential treatments for lots of neuromuscular conditions. And also a Darabone, also known as Radicava, is thought to have its mechanism of action via reducing the effects of toxic free radicals. Briefly, I wanted to touch on false fire alarms. So there's two ALS drugs that are implicated in the integrated stress response. So the Healy platform trial is where we can test multiple regimens, multiple arms, of different drugs with a shared placebo group. So patients who joined the Healy Platform trial, which is sites all across the nation, we're a site in UCSF, have only a one in four likelihood of being randomized to placebo and a three in four likelihood of getting the active treatment that's being studied. And at UCSF, we have Regimen F and Regimen G currently enrolling, and both of them target the integrated stress response. So let me talk about that a little bit. Cellular machines that make proteins, they have a fire alarm that they can pull if something's going on, if they're under stress, and that can pause the protein production. That's the integrated stress response. And in healthy cells, this is really helpful because if something goes wrong, you can pause, stop making proteins, wait to get your bearings, and then start up again. But in ALS, this fire alarm gets stuck in the on position. 
And this, as well as other effects, can lead to stress granules, impair nerve cell function. And one of the tests we're trying to do is find compounds that can help turn off the injury and stress response in ALS. Finally, there are risk of power outages in ALS, so mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are those power plants of cells, or solar panels since we're in California, making the energy that motor neurons need to function. And early on in ALS, the mitochondria start to malfunction, leading to cell injury and eventually cell death. We're all studying ways to protect mitochondrial functioning in ALS. And one of the effects of relivrio or MLX0035, sodium phenobutyrate tutka, may be via its effects on reducing stress in the mitochondria, as well as reducing stress on the endoplasmic reticulum, which works very closely with the mitochondria and cells. Kind of a throwback to when we had our very first ALS medication, really as well. So that works by reducing glutamate excitotoxicity. And I wanted to share an analogy that I, I think kind of gets to the heart of how this might work for cells. So imagine that your nerve cells are two people talking together at a coffee shop, but instead of using words, they're using glutamate because that's how nerve cells talk to each other with neurotransmitters. But in ALS, there's just too much glutamate buzzing around in the coffee shop and the room becomes incredibly noisy. And this excess noise and stimulation leads to overstimulation and stresses these nerve cells. And the stress eventually leads to injury of the nerve cells and death of the nerve cells. And so that's how really tech is, works. It reduces the glutamate levels to reduce some of this excess glutamate excitotoxicity is the buzzword. Um, neuroinflammation is was brought up that some of the um, some of the immune responses as a potential mechanism contributing to ALS. So inflammation is normal. Inflammation is part of normal physiology. It helps us respond to damage or infection. But sometimes inflammation can be counterproductive and lead to cellular damage. And that includes by some of the support cells around neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. So this abnormal neuroinflammation that accompanies motor neuron death in ALS is probably a response to rather than primary cause of cell death in, in most cases, but it can be kind of interlocked and um, and and an additional potential target to improve, improve function in ALS. Okay, that was a lot of talking. So I'm going to pause because I saw how many great questions were asked earlier and want to make sure there's time for everything. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. This was terrific. Thank you so much for this. Um, Dr. Spencer, if you want to come back on camera too, um, I'm sure some of these questions will be for you. Um, and Dr. Gosslinga, if you want to just stop sharing your screen, that's great. And then the three of us will pop on and um, I'm going to fire away some of these terrific questions, uh, research and clinically related. So um, this probably ties back to one of the Barber Award winners presentations, but um, we do have a question about whether there are any updates to treat C9 or uh, mutation treatment specifically. For so either. I can have a cocktail and then you can go after me uh, if you like. So I can tell you that the c 9 orf mutation, which, as we all know, is actually the most common genetic mutation causing ALS. It's around 6% of all cases of ALS are caused by that mutation. Um, and it's what we call a founder mutation, uh, which is kind of fascinating. It means that it originated in one patient somewhere uh, in the past and then spread. That's called a founder mutation. Other mutations are just random. They happen randomly in, in society. But this is one mutation that happened. actually happened, we think, in Finland somewhere, uh, in Europe. And it's kind of fascinating, the biology, because that one family that started this whole thing and got this C9 mutation back in Finland many hundreds of years ago, then spread and, and um, had children and they spread actually west. And so that, that mutation C9 is seen in the west, across America, Europe, but you don't get it in China. You don't, it, the, the family never moved east, so the, the disease hasn't spread to China. So it's a fascinating uh, mutation in that sense but very common in the West. And to ask you, answer your question, yes, we've tried. We, we had an ASO attempt at c 9 orf mutation, and it didn't work. And in fact, the patients uh, seemed to even get a little worse, so they had to stop the ASO trial. So ASOs don't work in every case. Now, C9 is not 
just a simply a mutation of the gene. It's something what we call a repeat disorder, where there's these hexanucleotide repeats that go like a machine gun through the gene, like da 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 da. And they have all sorts of complex biology. So when the, these cells now make an abnormal protein called dipeptide repeats, and they fill the cell up with all this toxic stuff. And then the gene itself doesn't make C9 off this protein that's essential. So it's, that's a lack of function and it spits out all these nasty things. So you've got a gain of function and a lack of function at the same time. Very complicated. So we're working on C9, but nothing yet. Jill, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, so Dr. Cleland from UCSF gave a, gave a presentation where she was sharing her work in non-animal models to use CRISPR, which is a different molecular tool to treat the abnormal repeat expansion in C9. So she she feels really excited about CRISPR as a path towards treatment of this. It's a very different tool than ASOs, um, but has a lot of additional science needs to be sorted out in terms of blood-brain penetration and things like that. That's great. Thanks to you both. Um, interesting question um, related to the presentations of the Barber Award winners. Um, someone's asking, how close are we to clinical trials potentially that might be tied to the research that they're work doing or working on? Um, I don't know if any of them want to comment on that, if they're still on. Uh, Kaiway's probably back in the lab, but uh, Eric? I guess I would have, I think probably my answer would be similar to Kaiway's where maybe the best clue is what is happening with Stathman 2 and UNC 13A. So the first publications that, so these are um, like, so for the two of us, at least um, we're studying things that happen downstream of TDP 43 mislocalization. And some of the first really important targets um, of TDP43, Stathman 2 in particular, those studies were published in 2019. And I believe Stathman 2 is already enrolling or is it in phase one trial now um, to, to, it's an ASO that's doing something different to sort of correct this cryptic splicing event that Kaiwei was talking about. Um, I I think a lot, most of us are super excited about that. So that's a what a four, three, four year period. That's probably as good as it gets. Um, and my work is trying to find you know more of these important targets. Um, and if any of them pan out, then maybe in a best case scenario, we would be hoping for a similar timeline. You know, four, five, six years. But we just have to. We haven't really found proven yet that any of the new targets are that important yet. Right. That's a good summary. Um, I think the Stathmin trial is very important. I think it's going on. The company is called Puralis, I think, is doing it. Um, but there's other people working on that target. And it's a little bit like the ASO acts like TDP. It's kind of blocking that cryptic. It's, it's making the, it's forcing the cell to make the right kind of Stathmin, the healthy Stathmin. Um, and that's a very exciting project and really the thing is with these trials guys if they're done correctly they can actually tell you about the biology because if it fails it means that we understand now if it succeeded in your biomarker in other words if the statin was was pumped out in the normal way and you still the cell the patients don't get better it tells you that that's not the way to do it so all these trials are critically important for understanding the disease so even if the trial fails we should be able to learn from it and move to the next one so just because a trial you know fails doesn't mean it's failed to make us understand more because now we know it's not Stathmin, so maybe it's UNC or another cryptic exon. So we're learning a lot. So the patient involvement in clinical trials is critical for us to understand more about testing some of the exciting data that you heard today. So you're involved as well, guys, on that end. And it's, to be honest, you know, Jill can talk to, it's hard for Jill and for the clinicians to advise what trial to go into because there are quite a few but, uh, you know, these events are for you to learn more about the different trials, and it's your choice of what trial you're going to ultimately. Yeah, there's a lot of trial options, and I'm happy to, there was one of the questions later on we'd probably get to, how to kind of, how to get involved in trials, and I'd, I'd be very happy to share contact information for the UCSF Clinical Trials Group, and I'm sure there's similar ways for patients to reach out to CEDARS and UCSD and Stanford. Absolutely. Yeah. If, um, any information you want to share about that, or if there are some things you want to put in the chat, that's perfect too. Perfect. A um, couple of things um, just related to uh, cause of ALS. We have a couple of questions. Um, um, one asking if chemotherapy could be a factor in causing ALS and someone's asking about 
potentially a knee replacement? Could that have caused their ALS? If anyone wants to answer or comment on those. Yeah, really good question. So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of epidemiologic research over time of different compounds and exposures. Could there be toxic exposures that increase risk of ALS? Not chemotherapy, to my knowledge. I know that there's a lot of evolving biologics and kind of targeted chemotherapies over time. Um, there's a, there's some clinicians in the ALS community who do really deep dive reviews of different compounds and exposures and nothing that I've heard of with chemotherapy. Um, knee replacement, so interesting just kind of to think about how the nervous system is structured and how it's kind of complementary with the musculoskeletal system. So when the orthopedists do the knee replacement, they're very careful to, to avoid any damage to actual nerves and the nerve structures. They're really just focusing on the bone, the cartilage, the ligaments. And so there's really not an effect on the motor neurons in that case. And so knee replacements shouldn't be a cause of ALS. Although sometimes people who, um, sometimes people who've had a surgery might then have more. Maybe they initially had a mild weakness of walking, but they were able to compensate for it. They didn't notice it, and then they have something new, like a problem with their knee or problem with their back. That's not an ALS problem, but it might lead some of the subtle clinical signs to be more noticed, and then lead to a person to seek medical care for that. So that there might be a bit of a bias that way. And, and this next question might be tied to what you just answered. You know, we know with um, people in the military and veterans that they're twice as likely as civilians um, to be diagnosed with ALS. Um, tied to that, um, someone's asking if they you might see an increase in ALS in firefighters. That's actually my, I really want to do that research. That's specific, that research, because one of the projects I'm doing next year is looking at the effects of wildfire smoke exposure on rate of ALS progression. And so there's, there is research out there that certain, certain types of air pollution, PM 2.5, specifically kind of diesel exhaust type things have a, are associated with the increased risk of developing ALS. It's part of that interplay between environment and genetics. And so I am not aware of research already published and done on firefighters, but I think that it's a very interesting population where we could learn a lot about the risks for that. Thank you for that. That's very interesting. Um, for either of you, what are the differences, if any, between upper and lower motor neurons? I know clinically, but I'm. I, do you have specific answers molecular epidemi epigenetically, Dr. Prenson? Sure, why don't you do the clinical and then I'll... Perfect, yeah. So upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron are just some of the classic things you love to teach a medical student as they're, as they're on your neurology rotation. So the upper motor neurons, that's where the cell body is actually in the motor cortex, which is the outer part of the brain where the cells are. And then the tail of it that acts on goes down through the brain and through the spine all the way until it connects with the lower motor neuron, which lives in the spine at different levels, like in the neck for the arm motor neurons and the lower down for the leg motor neurons. And the upper motor neuron, the way we think about it clinically is the symptoms that a person gets when there's damage to the motor neurons in different places. So if there's damage to the upper motor neurons, that causes spasticity, which is the tightness of muscles when trying to move the muscles around, really jumpy reflexes or pathologic reflexes that can cause clumsiness. Even if a person isn't really all that weak, they just really can't button things as well anymore. Difficulty with maybe typing and it causes slowness of movement. So that's why when neurologists have you tap really fast, there can be slowing of that. And that movement slowing can happen not just in the hands and feet, but also in the speaking swallowing muscles. So a person might have really slowness of their speaking and kind of slowed movement of their throat muscles. And then the lower motor neuron, so that's the neuron that connects directly to the muscle down in the arms or legs or trunk or in the, in the tongue. And when there's damage to that, that can cause that muscle twitching, that fasciculations that people might have can lead to the atrophy and actual smallness of the muscles and is a, a bigger effect of kind of leading to really severe weakness. And if there's damage to the lower motor neurons, then the reflexes usually get very, very small or go away. And so ALS canonically affects a mix of upper and lower motor neurons and kind of evolves over time. And that helps the neurologist identify that. Thank you. Dr. Spencer, anything to add to that one? 
No, Jill did a great job. Um, and they're, they're both, I think we mentioned this, they're both extraordinarily long cells. I mean, it's a single cell up here, which for me goes three foot all the way down to my spinal cord. It's kind of an amazing that these things even work. Um, and as we, as Jill mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stress during life on these cells. And so the upper motor neuron is what initiates the movement. So you have another feed into that that then says, okay, fire. And then this one fires, goes down to the spinal cord. And for the arms, it stops and has a connection. We call it a synapse with the second motor neuron, which is in your spinal cord. And that motor neuron goes all the way out to specific muscles. So when I move my hand, I'm firing first the upper motor neuron, as Jill mentioned, and then it goes, the signal goes all the way down my spinal cord, goes through a little synapse, releases a transmitter, and then fires the second motor neuron. So as we mentioned, you know, that's why if you have the lower motor neuron, you have a different kind of symptom to the upper motor neuron. But ultimately in ALS, to be diagnosed as ALS, you have to have involvement of both upper and lower motor neurons. And that'll be what your neurologist will tell you. If you have just one or just the other, they're different names, uh, primary lateral sclerosis, et cetera. So, all right, that's my short version of the upper. I love it. That's great. Um, and just thank you guys both for putting some information in the chat about um, clinical trials uh, that are happening right now, coming up at your institutions. Um, you know, I don't know that age necessarily makes a difference in terms of which trials a person might pick, but someone's asking if you might particularly recommend one over the other for younger ALS patients. There's just so many ways to think about different trials, whether it's a placebo controlled trial or it's an open label earlier trial. I just, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the Healy platform trial, which I see a lot of patients for, and it's one of the most popular trial at UCSF. That's a really awesome design, just epidemiologically, biostatistically designed, where a person will be, have a 75% chance of getting one of the platform drugs, which have been shown in earlier studies to be, have really good prompts for ALS. And then they are on that for six months. And then if they want, they can be definitely on it for a year and not placebo controlled anymore, definitely on it. And then if they want to stay in the study and, and the younger patients often have more slowly progressive ALS, then if they still meet the eligibility criteria, their breathing's okay, things like that, then they can roll over and be in the next arm again without having to go through the re kind of rescheduling and contacting and um, the, the full rescreening process. So it's a nice way to kind of be in a longitudinal trial and to try different medications and get exposure with that. Thanks, that's great. Um, any thoughts on taurine in ALS? We might wanna explain what taurine is. Um, reasons for taurine accumulation in the CNS and does it appear to be neuroprotective? I'm pulling up ALS Entangled. I don't know if I have a few. Well, it's an interesting amino acid. I don't know of its connection in ALS, um, but you know, there's, the deeper you dig on Google, the more you'll find associations of various things with ALS. Um, and we're trying to follow up on as many as we can, guys, but I have a very open mind. Um, for me, it showed me the data. And, and you know, if you can show taurine is effective in, in either reducing or accelerating ALS in your company. I just don't know that data very well. If Jill doesn't, then maybe someone else does from our postal award winners. I just, put in the chat. I just put in the chat, you can, um, you can add Turing as, and vote for it under ALS Entangled and a group of neuroscientists, neurologists will do kind of a, a deep dive into it. And there's this, this patient centered website, ALS Entangled, I put in the chat and certainly list it there. And I might be getting it for review in a couple of months. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thanks so much. Um, this is probably for either one of you. Someone's asking, so does usual nuclear TDP43 accumulate in the cytoplasm just because it spills out of the nucleus? So normal healthy cells don't have mislocalization. It doesn't normally spill into the nucleus. Uh, but however, I think, I think, um, Kevin, maybe we show some data in aging. And so, and there is evidence in, in aging brains and even like Alzheimer's and other neurological diseases, there is some mislocalization of TDP43. So I think, I don't think it's the specific marker that says, right, ALS. There's definitely some overlap with other neurological diseases. And I think that brings up 
general overlap. I mean, we it wasn't presented at the meeting, but some evidence now, early evidence that perhaps synuclein is involved in ALS. They found some of the seeding is happening in 10% of ALS patients. So I think this speaks to the complexity of what we're looking at, is there could be some overlap between ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's we don't quite understand yet. And the intersection of all of it is, is aging. When we all age, we accumulate things in the cells, and then maybe some TDP is definitely going up during aging, you know, in general, but nothing like you see in ALS. Finally, the brain has, you know, hundreds of billions of cells, and every part of the brain has a different type of neuron. And it's fascinating to me that in ALS, it's a very specific subset of neurons that have this TDP pathology, whereas a neuron next to it is perfectly healthy because it's not a motor neuron. So we have all these things to try and think about with the brain and, and these diseases, but we're, we're trying to figure them out. And TDP is a player, uh, but it's not clean and just ALS. It's probably involved in aging as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. That's great. A um, couple of things just related to talking about clinical trials. Um, someone's asking um, whether any of these trials might be relevant to someone with C9 or um, someone's also asking if there might be trials uh, for those who are diagnosed uh, three years or longer um, after diagnosis at this point. I'll, I'll speak just to bring out there, we often are referring to active treatment trials when we say trials in ALS, but there's also a lot of amazing research opportunities in the observational research side to share your share your clinical data with researchers so that we can really understand better what is causing ALS and what treatments work best for which people. And so after three years, I, I'm not aware of any interventional trials, at least at the sites that I work with it, in California that would enroll, but certainly observational trials would be open. Um, I just on, a, on that <clears throat> note, see the Sinai, the stem cell trial that I've, uh, I've mentioned briefly, I could go into if there's time at the end a little bit more. Uh, we are opening that up now for patients who are a little, little further along in the disease course. Now, because it involves surgery, though, you have to have a certain amount of respiration function, 50% of your false vital capacity. So that's really the restrictor. <clears throat> but if you have good breathing, even though you're three years or, or more in, we'll consider you for, for that trial. So that's, again, it's in the chat. It's the clinical trials, uh, CNS10, NPC, GVNF product that we're putting into the motor cortex. So please look at that if, if you're over three years and talk to our staff. Perfect. And I see um, just a couple more questions. Um, someone's asking, have antioxidants other than Adarabone been studied in ALS? So I cheated on this. I looked this up on ALS Untangled because I saw it on the, on the queue. Um, so there was a study, a small study of a combination of vitamin C and five other antioxidants with patients with ALS and compared to placebo, there was no change. So um not to say don't have a varied diet full of fruits and vegetables and vitamin if, if, if indicated, but there's not to my knowledge evidence of other kind of supplemental or non-prescription antioxidants that have been effective. I can't beat Google, so I'll, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> um, what's the d main distinction between PLS and ALS? Yeah, so remember earlier I was talking about the upper motor neuron changes where there's spasticity and slowing of movement and brisk reflexes. So in PLS, you just have that. You don't have the fasciculations, you don't have that atrophy. And if you do the EMG, that's the needle testing, which really only is able to look at the nerves after they leave the spine, so all those lower motor neurons, the EMG should look normal. And we repeat the EMG over time and follow these patients over time because some patients who are initially diagnosed with PLS might evolve into ALS after a couple of years. But PLS has its own specific treatment and it needs people need medications to relax the muscles. They might need kind of additional breathing supports, but they can live a lot, lot longer than patients with ALS. And so um, they, they have its own kind of mix of improving quality of life and really reducing the spasticity that we focus on. Sure. I think that just comes to the point of distinguishing the upper motor neuron and the lower and the one in the spinal cord going to the muscle. And if that one is still intact, 
like Jill said, you get these, because it's still working, there's just nothing to control it. So it kind of gets spastic and <laughs> tightens up because it's still functioning, whereas the upper one is gone. And so that's kind of a different different disorder. Also, I think it's about 10%, Jill, is it? Or less than that. It's not. It's pretty rare of, of, of pain. Oh, one percent, I think 1% European. of motor neuron patients are PLS, yeah. Very rare, yeah, rarer than that. I think they then convert quite often, as Jill said, so, yeah. Last question I'm gonna ask in the interest of time, and then we'll put up some contact information uh, for those who may have other questions after this. Um, any update on the status of Neurone? Uh, I, I don't have an update in kind of recent six months or so. Clive, do you? Well, yeah, a little. Just only that they're still they're still going back to the FDA uh, with more questions. Now they, as you well know, they appealed to the FDA. Their phase three trial uh, was was showing that it wasn't efficacy um, on the major outcome. So they had to go to the FDA to ask them for approval if they wanted to get around the fact they didn't have efficacy. But as you know, they looked in certain subgroups and they did see stuff. Uh, the FDA turned it down, and and so that was the result. Um, now they're still going um but i don't have much more brand new they're looking at biomarkers in their study and they're, they're showing some more results from that um and i did hear joe that they're going back to the fda for more discussions still so they're still trying to fight to move forward um okay but you know it's very disappointing guys but but honestly if we have to be tough we, we have to take the data that we see and accept it and you know it's difficult um but the fda were very fair i think in their discussion uh, about the trial and, and when you approve a drug for ALS it's a huge um, thing to do and it has to be based on really good supporting data otherwise people would be having this treatment and it doesn't really work and that's worse in some ways so it's very complex and, and okay. could talk for a long time about it but I, I think uh, watch out they're still interested in trying to uh, to move forward in ALS but I'm not sure that they're going to get too much further they'll have another discussion with you I don't know what you think. Yeah. Just to comment that when I think about taking care of my patients with ALS, I also have to think about all the future patients with ALS because um, it's an incredibly common disease given how rare it is because of the relatively shortened life expectancy. And so I'll, I'll, the patients I get next year and the year after, the patients I see 10 years, the patients I see in 30 years, I want to make sure that there's not medications approved out there that are kind of using potentially have risks and don't give benefits. Like it's, it's a really hard biostatistical question as well as kind of neuroethical question about how to, how to think about these sort of treatments. So. Thanks you both. I, that's really helpful for our community and um, ALS, we at ALS Network promise to keep our community updated to just as things uh, proceed with their own. So um, huge, huge thanks to you both for being here. Um, thank you to all three Barber Award winners as well. And big congratulations to all three of you. I think we have some more slides to put up. Um, and really, thank you all for being here tonight. We're grateful to each and every one of you for your time and commitment and just being a part of our community. If you have other questions that weren't answered tonight, please do email us at askme at alsnetwork.org. And we invite you to save a couple of dates coming soon. Our next Ask Me will be held in a town hall format in February. It's going to feature some more updates about ALS Network, um, and we'll feature our incoming president and CEO, Sherry Strahl. Uh, join us, too, for our annual special day of remembrance on Saturday, March 23rd, to honor all those we have lost to ALS. Um, we also have a couple of events coming up where you could spend a beautiful day outdoors at our Jim Tracy 5K, our SoCal Ride Hike and Walk in the next few months. Please do join us for any of these inspiring and com community building events. As you know, philanthropy fuels everything we do, and we're grateful to the committed donors who give generously throughout the year. To learn more about how you can support the valuable programs we offer, like this one tonight, please visit our website at give.alsnetwork.org. Give We've changed. And thank you for wearing all of your ALS Network swag, Dr. Svensson, tonight. Um, please watch for the short survey on tonight's presentation that you'll receive via email to help us plan for future educational programs. Thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. This was fun.
Thank you, everybody. Stay up.